Well, high tech here at the office, I just went over and I learned that uh, over 50 people are already in the chat. So uh, thank you everyone, many people on time today uh, for our, our seven o'clock uh, chat this evening. And so we'll get started. My name is Lisa Short. I'm the executive director for the Hospital Foundation. And it's my pleasure to be here this evening with all of you. It's interesting. Um, I was just saying to the doctors in, in the back chat room that um, if this was a live event on an evening like this with sleet and snow, uh, we would be a wreck worrying about everybody getting where they needed to be. So um, I know that our doctors are safe in their homes and or uh, offices and, and ready to take on uh, this evening's event. So uh, it's one of those nights where we're certainly uh, happy for the technology that we've all been using quite a bit more in the last couple of years. We'll take a moment um, to begin with a land acknowledgement. In the spirit of truth and recon reconciliation, and as we gather here today, we acknowledge and are grateful for the opportunity to meet on what is the traditional territories for the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the neutral people. These peoples have been on this land for thousands of years. We recognize their historical connection to it and their elders. We thank them, past and present, for their many con con contributions. I also have um, the privilege of um, a couple of housekeeping items of sharing those. Uh, for best sound quality, only our presenters, microphones and cameras will be operational this evening. So if you do have a comment to share, we'd ask that you use the chat box, box fun function. Um, this event will be recorded and a link will be emailed to all registrants in the coming days. So let's get started. Tonight's virtual chat, Women in Medical Leadership, is in honor of International Women's Day taking place tomorrow. The chat will be moderated by Dr. Sharon Ball, family medicine physician and co-lead of the Waterloo Wellington Pandemic Response tri Triad uh, for Ontario Health West Region. Uh, Dr. Ball is also uh, co-chair of the COVID-19 Health Sector Control Group for Waterloo Region, and I bet she's getting tired of talking about COVID. I can only imagine. <laughs> Joining Dr. Uh, Ball is Dr. Kirsten, uh, Kristen Wadsworth. Uh, she's the Chief of Obstetrics and Gynecology here at CMH, and also uh, Dr. Mahila Kumanen, Chief of Family Medicine here at CMH. I think um, we all are well aware at this point that International Women's Day is a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. Uh, on this day, we celebrate women's achievement, raise awareness against bias and take action for equality. I think it's uh, pretty safe to say that in our community and at CMH specifically, we have many amazing women leaders. And I'm honored to be sitting here today with some fabulous women that have achieved a great deal. I look forward to hearing about their roles, experiences and passion for healthcare. Uh, to everyone joining us this evening, thanks again for being with us. We'll get you to sit back, relax and make yourself com comfortable. Dr. Ball is going to moderate this evening, and uh, perhaps you'd like to be the first one to share uh, how being a female physician involved in many leadership roles, including motherhood, a clinic, CMH privileges, co-chair responsibilities, how all of that has impacted your career. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, thank you to everybody for attending tonight. I totally agree with you about how different this would have been before the Zoom and how we would have had really probably nobody, including ourselves, perhaps show up. So really happy to have everybody join us on the call. And, you know, um, I'm very appreciative. I think uh, Dr. Kuminen and Dr. Wadsworth and I are really appreciative that CMH Foundation has put on this event and really marking International Women's Day, really as Cambridge being as innovative as we are. We're leading the way and doing it a day early and uh, celebrating the entire week. And for those who don't know, there's um, International Women's Day is being marked tomorrow, uh, March 8th. And there's actually the second annual Canadian Women Physicians Day that's also this week, March 11th. So I think in some ways that's even, even more appropriate. So thanks for that. Um, you know, uh, I, it's hard not to have a gender lens, I think, in conversations. I'd be interested to see what my colleagues think, but when we think about ourselves as physicians, it, it's hard not to have some of the gender lens when we're thinking about our roles or our careers. Certainly, I feel that way. And um, I've been fortunate to have many women colleagues, women leaders champion me, 
uh, sponsor me, um, promote me. We often say we should do that. We should, we should sponsor and cite and promote. Um, in my role um, uh, in leadership with the Waterloo Regional Campus with the medical school, McMaster, I've been really fortunate because we've had two regional deans, both women, uh, Dr. Kathy Morris and Dr. Margot Mountjoy, who are just phenomenal and, and really have been such mentors to me and to many others. Um, in, uh, in the role with COVID, I've been fortunate to work with many leaders, municipal leaders, uh, health system leaders, and that includes Dr. Wong, and, uh, who's our medical officer of health, and Lee Faircloth, the, the president of St. Mary's. And, you know, um, their understanding of sometimes my personal context has been really empowering, like through this, this whole period, as another example. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Christina Alyashevsky, um, just a, another wonderful physician leader that I've gotten to know with the OHT. And, and really, um, you know, I could go on with, with many examples, but I'll, I'll just end with one. And that's just an amazing uh, relationship that I've developed in another role uh, with OMA Women Committee with my co-chair there, Dr. Hammonds. And um, she and I are, are very different personalities. I don't know Dr. Fuminen if you know her, but she, we're very different personalities, but it has been such an amazing, um, amazing thing for me to be around women who lift other women up and also from whom I can learn so much. And so for my leadership journey, having women supports has been very helpful, but I think equally helpful has been the allyship from many, um, many men that I have learners to, to CEOs that I've had the privilege to work with who have leaned back and created space and, and really ensured um, that, that I was able to grow. And, and I certainly uh, know one is on the call today, uh, Patrick Gaskin from our hospital. And, you know, that really makes a difference too. So I think, I think um, as far as motherhood goes, um, you know, the way I think about it when I am hiring someone um, is that this is somebody who probably knows how to multitask. Uh, they probably know how to deal with conflict negotiation. <laughs> they probably can wear lots of different hats and they can probably smile, present strength when on the inside they're crying. So for me, it's actually always considered a strength. Um, but I have to say, in all honesty, I, I've also felt the, the opposite side of that at times, um, where I think maybe people have perceived it as a negative. So, so that's, that's what I would say. And I'm really interested, um, Dr. Wadsworth, in your experiences. You're our Chief of, of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology at CMH, uh, wear lots of different hats, and have a young family. So we'd love to hear your perspective. Thanks, Dr. Ball. And uh, thanks to the Foundation for inviting me to talk. Um, so I feel like I'm fairly new in this leadership role. I've been at CMH for about two and a half years now um, and been the chief of the department for the past year. And I think that I feel very lucky to be part of a department and an organization and a specialty that actually is quite supportive of women. You know, I take care of women for their um, gynecologic issues, take care of them in their pregnancy, deliver their babies. Uh, so, you know, we're around women all the time in our specialty. And so I think especially my male colleagues are are used to all of those uh, mother and, and women related things. Um, but I, I think, you know, to echo Dr. Ball, I've had a lot of great experiences at CMH with other surgeons and leaders um, and our current uh, chief of staff, Dr. Lee, uh, who are really strong women and strong advocates for um, having us participate and really um, make a big difference at CMH. Um, and I would say that my life is always this balancing act of all of my priorities and that there's a, delicate balance of work-life harmony that uh, can be a challenge sometimes. Uh, and certainly I think the one thing that I have learned is uh, to really ask for help and, and take the support of those around me, both within medicine and then outside of medicine. Uh, I have a very supportive husband. Um, I do have three small children, uh, very supportive parents and in-laws and other people who um, are around to, to really give me that support so I can do the, the medicine and leadership things that I like. Um, and then I think another strong support of, um, of colleagues, uh, both within my specialty and um, in other areas of medicine, because medicine is a really challenging job and it's not like many other jobs. And uh, a lot of people who don't have a lot of um, contact or context with it don't always understand the things that we go through. So, you know, I find a lot of strength in, uh, in my peers um, and the experiences that they have gone to and uh, gone through. 
Thank you, Dr. Wadsworth. So we've talked a little bit about sponsorship and mentorship, our support network and, and our contacts. So over to you, Dr. Kuman, and really interested in our, this is our chief of family medicine at Cambridge Memorial Hospital and, and my chief. And uh, just curious, Dr. Kuman, about your thoughts on the same topic and the many roles that you hold. Yeah, thank you, um, Sharon. Um, I mean, really interesting to hear both of your reflections. Um, and maybe I'll just start by saying I'm really pleased to be here today and I'm really um, proud to be part of this event, um, celebrating women. So, I mean, for me, I would agree with Kristen. I think it's always quite a balancing act. Um, there's always a lot to juggle when you're, when you're balancing the different roles of being a mother and a, a wife and a physician and a leader. Um, when I reflect on being a female physician, I think for me, it's been really interesting to see how maybe I've evolved and how I perceive that. Um, I know, you know, way back when I started in practice, it feels like a long time ago, um, I really ran with this assumption that I would be able to keep my personal and professional lives completely separate. And I, I thought that's what I would want. Um, and then when I started practicing, I realized that wasn't such an easy task. Um, you know, within my first year of practicing, I took a little bit of time off to get married. Um, and then shortly thereafter, um, had, you know, went through two different pregnancies, had my kids. Um, and I realized, I think with every significant life event that when I came back to work, my patients were really interested in knowing how things went. It was almost as though that relationship that I was building with them um, became quite reciprocal and they really wanted to know that my kids were well and that um, my family was doing well. Um, and, and so I think for me as a female physician, it just made me realize that, um, you know, being a wife and a mother and um, my patients having some exposure to that, I, I've often put pictures of my kids up in my clinic rooms. I, I think it just made me a real person to them um, and, you know, made me a bit more human, um, which, you know, ultimately to me is a really good thing. Um, I also have noticed, I, I really think that, you know, we get a lot of credibility as mothers. Um, so I, I definitely noticed when I came back to work after having kids that, you know, it was more likely that patients would say to me, well, what, what would you do in this situation? And what would you do if this was your child? Um, so I think by virtue of being a wife and a mother, I've sometimes been able to actually harness that and, um, you know, use it to, to gain trust from my patients. Um, when I think about being a female physician in leadership, um, I think I would, you know, really echo some of what's already been said. Um, I feel so incredibly fortunate to be surrounded by so many amazing um, women leaders, including those here today. Um, when I look at the, you know, CMH uh, tables that I sit at, um, certainly there are an awful lot of um, female physicians in leadership. Um, I also currently serve as a president-elect of the Ontario College of Family Physicians, and our current president is um, a woman who's also juggling similar um, priorities as I am. She's got kids at home, um, and we've been fortunate to have you know, pre many previous presidents who've been in similar positions. Um, so I, I think for me, I, I feel like, you know, most of the time I'm able to strike a bit of a balance, although I will acknowledge it is a moving target. Um, and, you know, like Kristen, I am quite appreciative to have a really supportive husband um, who is not in medicine, but I think has come to appreciate that we don't really keep nine to five hours in our world. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's always one of those tricky things that requires a lot of juggling and effort, but very rewarding. Thank you. Um, it's interesting um, to pick up Dr. Kuhn and your point about, um, about the credibility because I remember um, when I first started and I didn't have children um, and I was trying to calm a mom who had come in because her child was up all night and, and I was telling her I've looked in the ear, there's no ear infection and I said, and I just sort of started saying, um, I know it's very hard to be up all night with a screaming child. And she goes, do you, do you? And then I, <laughs> I really didn't. And it's so interesting because I say the same thing now and the deep empathy <laughs> that I have um, on how that feels like, it just feels less rote. And I think that there's the credibility and there's also, I think, just the incredible empathy, right? That we develop with our patients as, as you know, we age in some ways along with them and go through that life journey. So that really resonated with me. Um, 
you know, our community is not always aware of what we do because so much of what we do takes place behind the scenes, right? And so for both of you as chiefs in your department, I was wondering if you could talk about what a typical day looks like for you. If you wanna highlight a, a special project that you or your teams are, are doing, you know, things other than direct patient care and really um, what you do in your roles. So maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Wadsworth, if that's okay. Yeah, so, I mean, everyone knows that we deliver babies, which is a really important job uh, that we have at CMH. Uh, but we also do a lot for gynecologic care in our community. So we help women who are having heavy periods, prescribe birth control. Uh, we treat many cancers here locally. Uh, and then my subspecialty, I um, have done extra training in dealing with urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. So we really see women, um, you know, from the very young adolescents dealing with early period issues all the way up to, you know, I have patients that are in their 90s. Uh, so it's a real spectrum of, of things that I get to do. Uh, and for me, every week is different. Uh, there's some kind of combination of days in my office. Uh, we do on call for 24 hours where I'll spend 24 hours at the hospital delivering babies, dealing with gynecologic emergencies, uh, and then operating. So doing things like hysterectomies or bladder slings. Um, for me, in terms of chief duties, there's, uh, you know, I've, I'm learning a lot about administration and those kinds of things, which we don't get a lot of training in, in medical school. Um, so lots of uh, things like meetings and looking at guidelines and policies, dealing with patient concerns related to care that they may have had at the hospital, uh, and really kind of looking at where we want our program to grow. Um, you know, our, our delivery numbers are going up in Cambridge. We have a beautiful new wing of the hospital. So uh, we're really trying to make it a really positive experience for patients and their families. Uh, in terms of exciting things, I mean, we're always delivering more babies and happy to deliver more babies and uh, really trying to look for uh, making our department uh, a really strong, great place to work um, and trying to, you know, get back to a new normal after COVID uh, of supporting our families, continuing to give excellent care um, and, uh, and really make everyone feel like Cambridge is their community hospital where they can come to have their babies and have their surgeries and really get excellent care for the, the women in their family. Thank you for that glimpse into the breadth of the role. So same question for you, Dr. Kuminen. Um, yeah, I think, you know, when I when I look at my department, we are somewhat unique in that we are, um, as family physicians, primarily community based physicians. Um, so um, I think a big part of what I do in my role um, as the chief of family medicine really does connect back closely to to our day to day work as family family docs. Um, so a key priority really is supporting family physicians in my department and ensuring that um, you know, we have the collaboration that we do with the hospital and that we have the tools and information we need in order for our patients to access care, um, you know, in as seamless a way as possible. And I'm thinking particularly when we're looking at transitions from the community to the hospital and back. Um, I think really just trying to benefit and maximize um, being part of a, a, a close-knit medical community where we have that um, really collaborative relationship with the hospital. Um, in terms of a typical day for me, it, it's interesting that you ask. It actually um, reminds me of a conversation that I had with um, Dr. Kanak Ree when he was chief of staff. Um, so I, I was speaking with him about the chief of family medicine role before I um, took over. And I, I mean, he was so incredibly supportive. Um, and I, I remember him being very clear that um, while the position is you know, approximately about half a day a week or anticipated to be about that in terms of workload, um, he really recognized that you know, many of the female physician, uh, physicians who are also in chief positions don't really set aside a dedicated half day, but rather often will do that work. You know, I remember him framing it exactly as, you know, once the kids go, go down, he, he sees a lot of emails come through. Um, and I, I think just having that conversation with him um, really made me feel like, okay, this is something that I can do. I've got young kids at home, but clearly he understands the need for that balance. Um, so for me, I, you know, a typical day often is a busy day in the clinic, seeing patients of all ages like Kristen, um, and then weaving in my leadership work, um, either into the evenings or, you know, booking meetings for the day as needed. Thank you. And I, I think that's a great example, actually, um, of allyship, 
uh, and just Dr. Ree kind of creating that space and that and that um, and that safety, right? And 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 then you, of course, sort of seeing yourself um, in the role, what something he had already already seen, obviously. So that's a really nice anecdote. Um, on that topic, uh, as we're talking about our, our previous chief of staff, and we have a wonderful interim chief of staff now as well, and, and Dr. Winnie Lee, just wondering um, what brought you to Cambridge Memorial Hospital? Maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Kamenin. Um, yeah, thank you. So um, I joined this medical community um, just over 13 years ago. Um, and you know, it's it's. I have a bit of an interesting story. I I did my um, medical school at, at Dalhousie. I grew up in Nova Scotia, and then I came to Western for residency, um, and took a bit of a liking to the um, team-based care options in Ontario. So decided to stick around. Um, so I, I looked um, at many different communities before deciding on Cambridge. And when I met with the physicians in my family health team, and I think I see Russ Ashton and Jay Geddes on here, um, you know, really it was a good fit for me within that family health team. But definitely um, a big selling point was the relationship that our um, the physicians within my family health team had with the hospital. Um, so at the time we all admitted our own patients and we would take turns rounding on them. Um, and I think especially as a new physician, new to the medical community, it was a really nice way for me to stay connected with the hospital and um, for me to get to know some of the specialists and other team members that I'd be referring to. Um, and I I realized as I looked around that is not a, a common thing to see to see such a, a close connection between the community based um, physicians and the um, hospital. So that was that was my story and definitely um, knowing that I would be able to have that connection was quite a draw for me to, to join this medical community. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Wadsworth. So I um, actually grew up in Markham and my great grandmother lived in Paris. So I used to drive through downtown Galt on my way to go visit her. Um, and then after I did my medical school in Toronto and my residency in Kingston, uh, I came back to Toronto to do extra training. And then um, I knew when I wanted to set up a practice that I wanted to uh, practice in a community where I could live, where I could be involved in community and hospital events. Uh, and there was a job posting um, for CMH looking for someone in the OBGYN department uh, who had extra training in urogynecology, which was my subspecialty. So uh, I came for my interview when I was about two weeks postpartum with my second son and uh, my mom and my two-year-old and two-week-old came and I came for my interview. I met most of the other members of my department as well as some other members of the hospital community. Uh, and it just seemed like a really great fit. It seemed like a very supportive environment, uh, lots of really great, passionate people uh, within the specialty, within the surgery department and within the hospital. Uh, so uh, I, was, I was really excited to come here. And then, you know, since then I felt like it's a, a great community place where we're doing lots of exciting things but really it keeps that feel of us being able to work closely with other specialties um, and really feel supported in, in the medicine that we do for our patients. Thank you. Um, I'm sure we've, we've all been touched by something or someone that's you know, affected us deeply in our career choice. Um, in my case, it's interesting when I think about the factors that led me to consider medicine and family medicine in particular. I mean, of course, there's myriad, right? But one that always um, that always strikes me as a really pivotal moment um, is is really around my grandmother because um, both our our grandmothers lived with us for a period, but one grandmother for a bit longer, and she understood English and she could read it, but she was so hesitant to speak English and nowhere more than in the doctor's office. I think because it's a a very um, there's a vulnerable feeling. You don't necessarily have the vocabulary. So it was challenging. So I would um, always translate for her. I'd, I'd go with her to translate. And, um, you know, so what I, so in some ways I experienced being a patient, like being a 12 and a 13 and 14 year old, but in some ways I experienced being a 70 year old as well with a whole different set of problems. And what I was really impacted by was just the incredible care and the patience that I saw my grandmother um, receiving and really the dignity with which she, she received her care. And I think I didn't realize how impactful that was until years later 
when I thought about medicine and I started, you know, writing essays about why I wanted to do medicine. And in some ways, it's also why I chose family medicine, because that doctor was both my doctor, my parents' doctor, and my grandmother's doctor. And so that longitudinal piece was so helpful for me. And, you know, as I reflect on that story, I'm, I'm really curious, um, you know, what, what brought us to our careers. And I think that's a question we get a lot, especially from patients and, and learners. So maybe um, Dr. Kuban and I can ask you as a fellow family physician, what made you apply uh, to, to medicine and what made you choose family medicine as your discipline? Thanks, Sharon. Um, you know, I, I thought about this often. I, I don't know if there was an exact moment or an exact event that inspired me to go into medicine. Um, I was just one of these kids where I knew at a pretty early age that's what I wanted to do, and I, I never really wavered from that. Um, you know, but what I will say is I had a, a significant um, personal experience um, as I approached my um, time in medic medical school that certainly did um, inspire, I think, me to become the sort of physician that I am today. Um, so just in the year leading up to medical school, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and then when I was just a few months in, she actually passed away. Um, so when I, when I look back at that, I think it, like you, Sharon, it, it really gave me um, that perspective of um, working through the healthcare system and seeing it from more of a patient perspective. Um, and, you know, often that was, um, you know, we had really compassionate, and I should say my mother had really compassionate physicians, and I think our family felt really well supported. Um, but I think even um, knowing that we had a number of really uh, supportive physicians, sometimes the system itself can be so difficult to navigate, and that definitely stood out to me. Um, and, and I think, you know, with my mother being as sick as she was, um, her illness helped me to understand how much um, a patient's illness impacts everyone around them, particularly their family. Um, and I will definitely say, you know, seeing some of the physicians who cared for her and, and how compassionate they were in their, you know, really amazing bedside manner, I think that's really influenced how I approach um, patient care as well. Um, so as much as it, it you know, that um, experience didn't um, guide me into medicine, I think it really did shape the kind of physician I, I am today. Um, now, how I chose family medicine was, you know, a bit less of a clear path. From the time that I was, I think it was preteen and knew that I wanted to go into medicine, for some reason, I seemed to just know that I wanted to be a pediatrician. Um, and I was a pretty headstrong kid and never really wavered from that. Um, so when I got to med school, I, you know, eventually stacked all of my electives full of pediatric rotations across the country and was very enthusiastic. Um, and then I got to a few rotations in third year where I didn't have a choice and I was assigned a geriatrics rotation. Um, and I can tell you as a, as a young um, medical student, I was pretty upset and really just could not fathom why I would be assigned a geriatrics rotation when I thought everybody knew that I wanted to do pediatrics. Um, so, you know, I showed up, I did what I was supposed to do, showed up to the rotation and, um, you know, really um, worked with an exceptional geriatrician who um, cared deeply about his patients. And I think it just, um, that experience helped me to see that I did not want to actually not care for a subset of the population. Uh, so I, I realized that as much as I really wanted to work with kids, I could still do that. And also, um, you know, as a family physician, provide care to adults and elderly patients. So at the last minute, I made a change and ultimately chose to go into family medicine um, and have really never looked back. I feel really um, happy that I had that experience because it really feels like a great fit for me. Thank you. That's that's uh, wonderful, getting some insights into your personal story. Um, Dr. Wadsworth, how about yourself? What led you here? So uh, I would say I was always a, a kid who liked science and reading and discovering things. Uh, and my family is actually full of teachers. Um, but to me, what sort of led me to medicine is that it is kind of a blend of that teaching, learning, science. Uh, you know, you're teaching patients about what's going on with them, teaching medical students and residents. Uh, so I felt like it was kind of a good blend of, of my own learning and being able to teach as well. Um, and it also fits my personality. I'm, you know, anyone who knows me would say that I'm not a person who's very good at sitting still. Uh, I like doing things. Um, I don't like doing the same thing all the time. 
Uh, and that's what I really love about my specialty as well. Um, I actually started out medical school wanting to be a family physician. I had a really wonderful family physician growing up. Uh, and I loved the idea of uh, taking care of uh, patients through, you know, different life events. Um, and then I got to see my first delivery when I was in first year. And I said, oh, this is definitely what I want to do. And I, I still love delivering babies. Um, but then it was really when I was in third year and did my obstetrics and gynecology rotation that I uh, learned that I like doing surgery. I like dealing with uh, the gynecologic side of things. Uh, and I really like the, you know, the, the impact that I can have on patients. Um, you know, some of my favorite experiences are patients coming back after they've had surgery, they come back six weeks later and, you know, pre-COVID, they give you a hug and bring you some cookies and say, thank you so much. You know, I can do this now, or I, you know, I'm not staying home the way I used to, you know, it really has made a big difference. So I like that, uh, you know, being able to do something and have, uh, have a really great outcome for, for a patient. Thank you for sharing that story. And, you know, we're very privileged at Cambridge Memorial, Memorial Hospital to be able to teach and, and, you know, to know that we have a regional medical school here. We have learners, residents. And so, you know, your story about blending those two uh, careers actually is very apt and we're very lucky to have you in our community. Um, one, one question that uh, we get asked a lot is what do we enjoy most about our daily work? And similarly, the flip side, what do we see as some of our most significant challenges in our role as, as physicians? And so I'm, I'm wondering, um, Dr. Wadsworth, if I can turn back to you to answer that question. Uh, so I would say my patients are my favorite. Uh, so my, you know, I have a lot of older patients who I see for their um, urogynecology issues. Uh, you know, I really feel like I can make a big difference in their quality of life and what they're able to do. Uh, and then I also love, you know, my younger patients who uh, are pregnant, they're starting their family, you know, they're anxious, they're nervous. Um, so it, it's kind of nice to make those connections with patients. Uh, and delivering babies is like, you know, I had a, a, a physician I worked with as a medical student who said, think of what is not going to make you mad when you get woken up at three in the morning. And then that's the specialty you should pick. And I'm never mad to deliver a baby at three in the morning. So, so that part uh, so far has not gotten old. Um, you know, I, I think there are many challenges in, in medicine. The things that I find challenging are when there are complications or there are, you know, bad outcomes, uh, which is the reality of, of our jobs, um, you know, there are many moving parts and things don't always go perfectly or as you plan them to be. Um, so that can be very challenging to help a family through that. And then also, you know, for myself as a, as a physician, um, those, those times are very challenging. Uh, and then dealing with, you know, things that are often outside of my control. So uh, human resources challenges, other resource challenges, uh, you know, in medicine, uh, through the hospital, uh, dealing with pandemics, um, you know, those kinds of things are very challenging when you feel like you want to do your job, um, but there are so many outside factors affecting your ability to be able to do it. Thanks for that thoughtful answer, because, um, you know, you've layered patient realities along with, you know, what's going on, um, and as well as sort of um, system issues that that we have to deal with moving forward. And so it kind of gives, I think, a, a different perspective than than often we think of when we think about medicine. Um, Dr. Kuhnman, same question to you. Um, you know, I, I almost just want to say ditto with the challenges, like it's, you know, those system challenges and difficult um, scenarios really can make our, our make, make our jobs feel pretty tricky at times. Um, but maybe I'll start with the um, parts that I really love. I mean, no doubt it's it's the patient care piece. Um, I, I think in family medicine, you know, really it is having that relationship with our patients over a long period of time. Um, and, and I think what I find um, just honestly really amazing is just how much patients trust us. You know, often we have patients that we've known for years, but they'll come to us with you know, really personal private information, sometimes information about themselves or their lives that they've never shared with anyone else. Um, and I, I just feel so grateful um, to be able to have, you know, a little bit of a glimpse into their lives and, um, 
you know, be able to try to support them through, you know, whether it's the, the good things that are happening or um, sometimes the challenges that life brings. Um, I think it's it's that work that really brings meaning to us as, as family physicians. Um, I think in terms of challenges, you know, I'd say it's it's that connection and the investment we have in our patients that um, can sometimes be a bit of a double-edged sword. So, you know, when we are uh, have gotten to know our patients over years and then we, we see someone have a bad outcome or have to break bad news, I think it can often be really hard to then, um, you know, try to manage that, but then also come home to our family and and give our families the attention and, and um, energy that they deserve. Um, but I, I certainly wouldn't give up that connection to my patients and relationship that I have. And, um, you know, on that topic, um, one thing that is so wonderful is receiving a glimpse into the life of patients or updates from patients. I mean, those are the types of things when no matter how busy we are, or how tough our day is, it just kind of gives you that extra sort of uh, energy boost, right, that you need. Um, I, I think um, I'd be really interested in hearing if there is um, an example of an anecdote of something that was very impactful or just kind of gave you a lift that you can relate uh, relating to patients. So maybe back to you, Dr. Wadsworth, to start. Uh, yeah, so I mean, there's always so many, but uh, I think so. the two that have come up most recently is uh, I have a patient who um, is in her 90s. She comes to see me every three months because she has a pessary. Um, and so I haven't seen her in almost a year because I've just been back to work for a few months um, and I have a nine month old at home. And it was just so wonderful to see her. And she was so happy to talk about my daughter and ask questions. Uh, she's doing really, really well, had, you know, been having a lot of trouble with bladder infections and not being able to get out and do the things she wanted to do. Uh, and now she is, you know, she's, she's doing great in her 90s. So, uh, you know, to have patients, um, really have that connection with you and, and want to know, as Dr. Kuminen said, about, about your family and what's going on is a really nice part of the job. Uh, and I'm starting to get some patients now who I've delivered one of their babies and then they're pregnant again and I'm taking care of them again. And, and uh, the same kind of thing, I have a patient who, uh, who just delivered her fourth baby and uh, I've gotten to deliver two of them. And it's, you know, it's really wonderful to, to see the joy in her family and to be part of such a, a wonderful part of her life. And Dr. Kumanen, um, just listening to that story actually brought me some joy. Uh, Dr. Kumanen, how about yourself? Um, you know, I, I think like Kristen said, we I think we, we get to um, enjoy so many really lovely patient interactions. There is one in particular that um, stands out to me. So um, one of my older patients, elderly gentleman, um, was having a, a number of symptoms and we were, you know, really trying to get to the bottom of it for him. He and his wife were really concerned. Um, so, you know, did a bit of a workup. And then late one day, I got a result back for him that, you know, quite devastating, actually. Um, and I knew I needed to give him a shout and let him know so that he could then start um you know, making decisions in terms of how he, he wanted to manage this issue. Um, so we booked him a phone call the next day. Um, this was just in the last um, several weeks. And I, I realized as I approached the phone call that I was actually really dreading um, having to call him. And I just, I knew this was not the news he wanted to hear. Um, and, you know, somewhat unlike me, I actually procrastinated a little bit and went and did some paperwork, which anyone who knows physicians knows we don't choose to go do paperwork over patient care. Um, but I, I, you know, gave him a call, spoke with him and his wife, um, explained all of his results, tried to address the questions they had as much as um, I was able to. And I just felt really heartbroken, honestly, that I was having to give him this news. Um, so towards the end of the phone call, um, I just apologized to him and, and said, I'm so sorry that I have to be giving you this news. Um, and I think, you know, he, what he said to me in that moment really just um, completely changed the way I looked at that interaction. So he actually stopped me and said, you know what, it, it's okay. And I'm just so thankful that it was you giving me this information. Um, I would, I've, I've just, even to this day, I'm sort of stunned that, you know, in all of um, what he was going through, he was still able to um, express appreciation and, 
just identify how valuable the patient physician relationship had been for him. Um, so for me, it just really stood out as, um, you know, I, as much as, as it was really difficult and very difficult for him and his wife, um, just actually somewhat energizing for me to know that um, my pre-existing relationship with him had somehow, even a tiny bit, just made that interaction a little bit better. Thank you. That's, that's such a moving story and I can see on your face how impactful it still is, right? Um, one of the sort of switching gears a little bit, um, uh, in terms of let's try to reflect on our role as CMH Foundation Ambassadors, because all of us here are um, ambassadors and we lead conversations in the community to educate and inform um, everyone about our hospital, um, its importance, the excellence and care it delivers, and also um, to have um, really those conversations around donations, which our hospital needs. And so I, I think probably our audience would be interested in what led you to become an ambassador and why your roles as ambassadors are important. Um, so maybe I'll start, <laughs> maybe I'll change things around a little bit. Um, and uh, for me, actually, what was interesting was, um, it was a, it, similar to Dr. Kuhn, it was a patient encounter. So somebody was quite ill and I was making a referral to CMH and they asked me, um, do you think we should go to CMH? Like what hospital would you go to? This is very serious. Would you go to another hospital if it was your family? And, um, you know, I, I looked at them and I actually was really surprised by that question. So I said, you know, I delivered my daughter at CMH, uh, my little guy, when he got sick at around two, three years of age, I brought him to the eMERGE at, at CMH and he was admitted to the pediatric floor. Um, and, you know, when I had severe pain in my eye, I went to the emergency department and was told I had iritis. I mean, this is our local hospital. This is my hospital. This is where I take those that are most precious to me, whether it's my own family or my own patients. And, and that really is, the, is that belief in our, in our hospital knowing the excellence in care and the, and, and the equipment. And, you know, as Dr. Wadsworth said, the, you know, cutting edge pieces we do in terms of our technology and teaching, but it's really just that, that faith that I hope that hope folks feel when we're making those referrals. And that's really why I want to get more involved. And so with that said, just turning um, Dr. Wadsworth to yourself, um, what, were, what were your motivators to become an ambassador? So, you know, I also agree, you know, this is, uh, this is where I live. I take my kids to emerge here when they get stitches and when they have croup and all of those kinds of things. Um, and, and I think the other thing that's important to me is really being able to share the message that we really need support uh, from our community and from donors. Uh, there's so much that goes into running a hospital that I don't even have any idea about. I feel like I'm just starting to learn. Um, and really the foundation um, is a huge part of that in terms of funding patient equipment um, and patient care. So, you know, we really need uh, the people of Cambridge and people in the area uh, North Dumfries, everywhere else to, to support us to do the things that we want to do. And I think that most people don't, don't realize that they think, you know, you build a hospital and, and things will kind of run, but there are so many different parts, um, that, uh, that are involved in it. And, uh, Dr. Kumnen. Um. You know, first, I think I'll just start by saying it really is an honor um, to be an ambassador for the foundation, just um, really recognizing the good work that they do. Um, so for me, I think there are the really obvious reasons, um, some of what's already been said, just this idea of this is our community hospital. You know, my patients, I know, often will, um, when needed, go to the hospital and, and always receive exceptional care. Um, I, I also have my own personal reason um, that I think when, when I looked at becoming an ambassador, it just it seems so much um, more meaningful to me. Um, so 10 years ago, my son was born at CMH prematurely. Um, he was about 33 weeks, or he was 33 weeks at the time. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, health professionals make really bad patients. Um, so I did what any good physician would do. I went into labor um, and then went into complete denial um, and then just continued to work through my clinic day. Um, and then realized at the end of my clinic day that maybe I should seek care. Um, so presented to CMH in the evening and kind of um, 
presented myself where it was clear that uh, we needed urgent help. So kind of put the, the team in a bit of a bind. Um, and, you know, ultimately, ultimately my son uh, was, was like very healthy, just premature and needed some additional support. Um, eventually got transferred down to McMaster um, in the NICU there, then kind of did a bit of a tour of local hospitals, went to Guelph and then back to Cambridge. Um, but I, I think the point of my story is just when we needed it the most, um, it's just amazing to me how quickly um, the team at CMH um, jumped into action and, you know, everyone was focused on making sure that my son um, was healthy and got what he needed and that I was taken care of. Um, and I have to just say, while I'm telling the story, a special thank you to Dr. Strauss and Dr. Martinez, because, you know, every year on my son's birthday, I, I reflect back on just how amazing um, their care was and really how everyone came together to do exactly what was needed, um, despite me making some bad choices earlier in the day. Um, so I think just, you know, really looking at that, um, you know, firsthand seeing how um, we got exactly what we needed and more when we went to the hospital. Um, it just really makes being in this role so much more um, meaningful for me. Thank you and agree wholeheartedly that healthcare professionals make the worst patients, that's for sure, doctors and nurses alike. Um, I'm just looking at our time and I feel, um, I feel that, you know, even with my colleagues, I've gotten to know you so much better. So I, I really appreciate your answers. Um, Lisa, I see a, a question in the chat and uh, just wondering, it's I think an important question. I'm happy to hand it over to you or if you'd like me to ask it, I'm fine with that too. Well, yeah, I'll, I can I can step in, and uh, I had a little chuckle about health professionals making bad patients. So that was that was kind of fun, and I was glad to be on mute. But um, the the question that is in the chat is about um, what would you say to any woman interested in entering medicine? An interesting question. Uh, I can start. So what I would say is that it is a great job, but it's a it's a hard job. Um, you give up a lot of your time with your family, with yourself. Um, it's, it's certainly not easy, but it's very rewarding. I think surrounding yourself with both mentors and peers who are going to be able to support you, um, having friends and family and, and other people outside of medicine as well that can support you are really important. Um, and, you know, realize that it's, it's a an amazing experience, but um, but it takes a lot to to get there, and it certainly is not for everybody. I can I can build on that. Um, I, I would definitely agree with what Kristen has said, um, and I I think the part about family, just recognizing that you know I think we expect a lot of our family members as physicians, and that probably applies to both um, male and female physicians, but. Certainly for me, um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm so lucky to have a really supportive husband. And I, I think what makes such a difference is he knows how much the work that I do is important to me and how much I value it. Um, and, and I think my kids do too. My son is 10 and my daughter is eight. Um, and I think they know when I'm not, you know, when I'm not available to be you know, being, a, being a mother to them, it's because I'm off doing something else that's really important. Um, so I think that maybe brings me to my next point, just it has to be something you love that you really want to do. I think like Kristen said, you know, you need to be willing to wake up at three in the morning to do this work um, and, and still love doing it. Um, and I, I think the pandemic has helped us to to really connect back to, you know, finding our why, you know, why did we go into medicine? What, what is the, the higher purpose for us and what keeps us going, um, including when the times get tough? Dr. Balkin, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I think, um, I, I think, you know, we want to encourage, I, I would definitely want to encourage girls and women and STEM and in medicine, but I think, you know, to be very honest, it is really challenging back to, back to what both my colleagues said. That's not to say that we have insurmountable challenges at all, but I think that it is something conversations I have with learners all the time when they're trying to pick their specialty um, and when they perceive barriers in their specialty. And I think that, you know, we would 
be remiss if we didn't say that there are challenges for women physicians, for sure, when we think about the balance, the disproportionate amount of work that sometimes we have to take on at home, um, you know, just speaking broadly, maybe sometimes expectations, um, even sometimes um, in, in clinic and, and certainly you know, when we're doing family planning, like those are common things and themes that a lot of a lot of um, learners and, and residents will bring up and even practicing physicians. And I think there's a little bit of guilt as well. Like I um, definitely felt, um, you know, my first maternity leave was seven weeks, but I feel like I felt very guilty about it. I felt guilty that it was short for my child. And I felt guilty with the clinic because my locum herself was pregnant and I didn't know that until she started. So I couldn't get even another day out of her. And uh, I think there's a lot to balance. And I think, um, I think you really have both, both my colleagues said you have to really love it. And, and I, I would just echo that, like, you know, if it speaks to you and it's your calling, cause it's not really a job, it's a vocation. And, you know, if that piece um, really speaks to you, I think all of those things with good mentors and, and colleagues is really um, something that you can get past, but it definitely has its challenges. And I think it's not for everybody. Well, along those lines, we're, we're all, um we're all looking at this in some way or other. How do we look after ourselves after what, you know, what's happened over the last two years? And I just imagine all that you're juggling uh, with children and, and, and your careers. And it, how, how do you practice self-care? What do you do to look after yourselves? Or is that a, something that's really difficult to find time for? Maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Ball. Yeah, I don't know. I think we're all, um, we all bristle at the words resilience and balance, or at least I do. And I, and I don't want a module on it, but I would say what keeps me a bit young. And, and I liked the way Dr. Kuman put the, put what is your why, um, is really the kids for me, like my, my children who really, I think have good careers ahead of them as comics, if they were ever interested, but definitely, um, it's that, you know, I think we've all experienced it. We come home, the door opens before we've even parked the car in the garage and you see these two excited faces and and you know as you listen to their day um you know and, and you listen with excitement they ask you about your day and if that was the first question you'd probably be a bit grumpy but after you sort of wind down you realize the privilege i think that you have and and i know for me it's it's the balance is really from from the amazing privilege of like seeing these two you know um 12 and, and 15 year old good gracious going to be out driving at some point but but these, these young people um kind of on this journey with you and um and they do they're, they're part of the team they're really part of the healthcare team in some ways in our house because they make us um, the people that we are and i for me make me a better physician so i would say that that's my energy for sure is from my for my little ones mm -hmm. um Doc oh sorry i was yeah, just yeah go ahead please do that's, that's perfect, perfect. Uh, yeah, I, I, for me, I, I think I immediately think about family, and I, I would say um, I, I think my family really keeps me grounded. They keep me honest. Um, you know, my my kids um, definitely sort of what Sharon described. Like, you know, they're always thrilled to see you, um, and that it just doesn't get any better than that. Um, and you know, they I I find I whenever I'm around them, I definitely have a smile on my face. And I've I've come to learn my husband likes making me laugh. It's one of his daily goals as well. So, you know, I've got it pretty good at home. Um, and I think that really just makes a huge difference. Um, you know, not not that we need to find our why as a family, but um on a lighter note, my daughter recently has discovered um Harry Potter. And um, so we've, we've gotten into the movies. That's been, you know, a, a very important priority in our home on Friday nights to, to watch a bit of Harry Potter. Um, and I'm just proud to say, I think one of the things that keeps me smiling and young is um, when my kids break out a Harry Potter spell, I at least know a little bit more about what they're talking about. Yeah. So I think it's just those lighter moments, you know, really enjoying the quality time um, with those we love. And uh, what I would say too is that I have really been focusing on uh, living in the moment when things are happening. Um, my kids are three and a half, five and a half, and nine months. So, you know, we're in the trenches, is what my husband will often say. Um, and, uh, you know, when I'm at home and I have those few hours after work before my kids go to bed, I'm, you know, trying not to be on my phone, trying not to be looking at work things and really focusing on them and doing what they want to do. Um, because the reality is that the work will always be there. There's always going to be something and someone asking for it, but, uh, my kids are only around for a short period of time. So, you know, if they want to run around and 
pretend to be butterflies that emerge from their cocoons and that's what we're doing so uh they are also comics uh, along with Sharon's children so they can uh, they can start a comedy troupe that's for sure um but I think you know and I and I think in some ways that you know the pandemic has been very challenging for for everyone yeah. in many ways um, and I know certainly for us with small kids it has been challenging but it it also has kind of forced us to slow down and you know not be running off places and to be at home and play outside and, and, you know, really enjoy those aspects of life. So, you know, I'm trying to, to be mindful of, um, of all the, the, the good things that are around us. Yeah. Yeah. It is a short time when they're little, cause mine do not run to the door when I come home anymore. Um, so there you go. Uh, uh, there's lots of great comments coming in and uh, you know, a lot of respect and, and appreciation for all that you do, which is, of course, how we're all feeling tonight after hearing all of you, all of you speak. Um, I did want to be respectful that there was another question in there, um, switching gears a little bit, just around any specific training that helps you with the leadership piece. Is there, is, do you get much of that in, in medical school or do you seek that out in other ways? Um, maybe we'll start with you, uh, Dr. Wadsworth. Sorry, having mute issues. Um, so I, I would say, I mean, we get a little bit in medical school and uh, get to do some, some leadership roles as chief residents and things like that. Uh, but there isn't a lot of formal training. Um, I have been uh, starting to do, there are some courses through the CMA Jewel. They have uh, online leadership courses that I uh, have started to work through on my own. Um, but then I also, I take a lot, uh, I mean, I, my husband has an MBA. He's my business <laughs> person who is, is uh, my, my mentor for such things um, and other people in other areas. I think that medicine is not always the best at, uh, you know, really specifically talking about leadership and, and meetings and, and being able to talk to people and hiring people and things like that. Uh, so I really um, have kind of drawn on the, the different people in my lives who may have those skills. Uh, and then, and then seeking out some formal, some formal courses as well, fitting them in amongst all the other things that we're, we're trying to do. That's right. Dr. Kuman, did you have anything to add on that or? Um, a, a lot of the same, I would say. Um, and, and definitely, I think, you know, a, a great female leader um, told me way back when to just make sure I spend time with other really um, smart female leaders. And so that's what I do. And um, sometimes I find that's a whole lot more informative than than any course I could take. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Ball, did you have anything uh, to add as we wrap up here? I, I think I think similar to to both of those answers, certainly with the CMA Jewels courses and and a lot of informal mentorship um, for sure. Uh, but um, in the, I, I was fortunate in the academic role to again have these two amazing deans and and Dr. Margot uh, Mountjoy um, was uh, you know uh, supported me in um, getting some additional leadership training in this academic leadership program at McMaster and I have to say it was very helpful it was a, a very intensive course and really bonded with other folks for that role that's been really helpful for me um, and I had some transferable skills but I agree with that, Dr. Wadsworth I think that's something that we don't really learn and or we don't necessarily get access to except in some situations and sometimes you know again it's hard to kind of fit on the fly so in some ways I wish it was a bit more baked in uh, for us. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can't thank you enough um, for joining us this evening, supporting the foundation in this way and giving the community some of your time this evening to learn more about you and uh, what you do and why you do what you do. Boy, are we a stronger community because of the three of you. Uh, we are so blessed. Uh, the fact that you made a choice to be in medicine um, and some of the decisions along the way that helped you get there and, and some of those moments with grandmothers and, and family, like, uh, you know, what a gift that you're now 
and that you're now choosing to share with the people of our community. Happy International Women's Day. We're the first ones out of the gates to say that for tomorrow morning. And thank you to all of you for joining us uh, this evening. We really appreciate that you have joined us. And this is one of the drawbacks of the virtual chat. We don't get the applause at the end and we don't get that sense of being all together at the end of, a, of an event. So that I certainly miss and I look forward to getting back to things like this uh, in person with all of you, but it sure does have a purpose on a night like tonight. And again, thank you for your time to each and every one of you, Dr. Wadsworth, Dr. Kuminen, and Dr. Ball, a special thank you to you for, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone.